what Trevor Lawrence, Jalen Hurts, Bryce Young. They had all they knew from college was was winning. Urban Meyer, all mm-hmm. he knew from college was winning. And when you get to the NFL, if you don't know how. What is going on, Panthers Nation? Carolina Dad here, your host of the Two Growls, One Roar podcast, continuing our series, bringing on some fantastic guests. Today, I have Cassidy Hill, writer, reporter from Panthers.com. Welcome to the show, Cassidy. Hi, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here and kind of uh, get to know Panthers fans a little bit better. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. Has it been? It hasn't been in a full year, has it? It has been, I guess, seven months. I came okay. at the end of December, and Got that it. was uh, I started, I think, December 21st or something like that. So it's nice. Darren and I were joking today that it's only been seven months, but it feels like a lifetime. I'm but, sure. Yeah. I know I was out just looking at some of your work, just a ton out there. And number one, y'all should go out, follow, look at all of her content. But yeah, I think wasn't the first piece of content you did, the Green Bay preview if yes, I remember and I technically still worked in Green Bay when I did that oh uh, wow but <laughs> both but Darren texted me and he's like I think it would be really funny if you wrote this and yeah. my editor there in Green Bay was like I think it's funny too go ahead like you know I know That's you're not awesome. there for a few more days but yeah go ahead because my I worked in Green Bay up until my last day in Green Bay was the Matt LaFleur press conference on that Monday Okay. And then I left uh, Monday afternoon and my brother and I drove and we like stopped for that night and then we got here Tuesday and my first day in Charlotte in the Panther Stadium was Wednesday morning. Good grief. Um, so the first, at the time, Chris Tabor press conference yeah. previewing the Packers. And so I was like, the the first week was easy because I was like, okay, yeah. I know this, I know these teams. Cover them. Yeah. Easy to do. That's awesome. So I, I do want to like take a step back and I went and watched, I can't remember the name of the podcast, but I saw you go on a, a Packers podcast. I don't know, Probably. like maybe, maybe like a year ago before their training camp, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And I got to hear a little bit of your history, which was awesome for me to hear how you went, went to Bama. Yeah. But you're an Auburn fan. Is that still yes. like, do you pull for Bama at all? Or, yes, in the yeah. sense that, like, I'm going to feel, like, some sort of loyalty there just because I went mm-hmm. there and I had such a great time there. Um, but I don't – it's more like a casual interest. You know, like, I don't know, maybe it's the, the guy you broke up with and you still have fond feelings for, but you you don't wish him bad, but you don't yeah. think about him as much. Auburn is the one that like I'm always going to be in love with. Like that's that's my first love. That's who I grew up watching. That's who I grew up cheering for. But it's yeah. also impossible to grow up in the state of Alabama like I did, especially when Nick Saban did everything he did over the past, you know, Seriously. few years <laughs> and and not have it be a part of everyday life. Especially there's no professional teams in Alabama. So yeah. even if you were an Auburn fan, you know, everything that's going on with Alabama, you like, you know, Mm -hmm. know thine enemy. And um, so it's, it's impossible to ever not be a part of it. And so, yeah, I'll pull for Alabama. I feel like a kinship with other people who went there. That was the first Mm -hmm. thing Bryce and I connected about. And uh, so it's, it's like, yes, I still love Alabama and I loved my time there, but, I will always be an Auburn fan first and foremost. Yeah. Really, I'm probably more of a Florida fan than anything. Thus, this yeah. that's the team that I make sure to never miss a game for wow. and will watch consistently no matter the sport. And so, so you I went, I'm just you confused. Went, went, sorry, went to Bama. Sorry, went to, yeah, went to Bama, pulled for Auburn. And then you covered the Gators for like 10 yes. years or something. So nice. when I was in high school, I, even being an Auburn fan, I wanted to go to Florida. Like that was the school I always wanted to attend. That was 
I was uh, a junior in high school, Tim Tebow's freshman year at Florida. And I was like, this looks so fun. Mm -hmm. At the time, Florida had the number one journalism school in the country. And wow. then I went to a small school in Alabama, University of Mobile, for a couple of years. And then when I got ready to transfer, Alabama, by that time, Alabama had the number one journalism school in the country. They had just won right. a national championship. And um, they were also the first school to add what is – actually, they may have been the second or third. But they added what they called like a sports track. So all of my journalism classes were sports – focused mm -hmm. which nowadays a lot of schools do you can take sports media sports play-by-play -play. Uh, you can take so many sports journalism classes at different schools but you know years and years ago back when I was in school um Alabama had that Florida didn't and so it. it made it a pretty easy decision even though my grandmother still has not forgiven me years years later but I will I spent high school wanting to go to Florida mm -hmm. and so I watched a lot of those games and then, as you said, after I graduated from Alabama, my first job was in Gainesville. And that was just, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. And I was there for 10 seasons. And so uh, covering all sports at Florida. And so that's probably the team I feel the closest to mm -hmm. and the most loyalty for. Just because at this point, that's been over half of my life. Um, yeah. Watching the Gators and being around the Gators. So, yeah. That's awesome. Not a bad like place. I said, I'm just, I'm confused. Yeah. I pull for the SEC <laughs> Sorry. except for Tennessee. <laughs> there you go. Oh man. That's awesome though. A lot of you good gotta have football. standards. Exactly. A lot of good football there in the SEC. I'm an ACC guy, but my wife, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. I know. I know. <laughs> my wife is, it's so funny. I grew up, you know, North Carolina. So I was like North yeah. Carolina fan. I go to our games and then final. I started dating my wife and she was like, Oh, we're going to go to the South Carolina game. We're going to show you real football SEC. And I was like, it's not going to be that different. Oh, I was like, okay. Yeah. It's different. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> this is a totally different animal. Yeah. Crazy experience, which is awesome. Yeah. So Florida Gators. And then it sounded like Jacksonville Jaguars from there. Yes. And I was lucky enough to do those at the same time. Oh, um, wow. And Jacksonville was always, you, if you covered Florida, you've had to cover Jacksonville a little bit because mm -hmm. they drafted a Florida player every year. And so, you know, whenever people ask me about Jacksonville and I'm like, I, I really didn't start covering them until 2020, but I was at Jacksonville training camp every year. And mm -hmm. cause they always had a Florida player. So it was, it was always like the final portion of some path to the draft story that we'd be doing. Um, but then in 2020, started covering the Jags as well. I don't know how familiar y'all are with the geography of Florida. It's only about an hour and a half from Gainesville to, to the Jacksonville Stadium. And so it was – and the way the NFL schedule works compared to the college schedule, you can really do both. And mm -hmm. most people that cover one team cover the other. Like a lot of people in that market cover both teams. Makes and sense. so it was, I was able to do both, which was a lot of fun, especially because as I said, Jacksonville always would draft Florida players. So I knew, you know, a decent number of the guys that mm -hmm. were there on the team. They also drafted a decent portion of Alabama players. And so players that I'd covered or even been friends with when I was in school at Alabama, they were at Jacksonville as well. And that was uh, really my first foothold into the NFL. And you know, such a great learning experience. I have a lot of fond memories of there. I was there for Trevor's rookie season, which is also mm. why I think, just kind of jumping ahead, yeah. I give Bryce Young a lot of grace for what happened last year because I saw up close how a bad rookie season can can spiral quickly, even for a number mm -hmm. one pick when you don't have a coach in place, when there is a coaching change midseason. Granted, Urban Meyer and Frank Wright are two completely different situations because Urban Meyer, yeah. that was just a dumpster fire from beginning to end. <laughs> and so, but I, I saw up close how big of an impact that can make and how hard it is for a quarterback to not let it mess up their mental game because it would mm -hmm. be so easy to let a rookie season like Trevor had, like Bryce had, kind of completely throw you off your game and you never bounce back from that. Typically, because I saw it happen at Florida as well with Felipe Franks, 
Um, mm. And it did take him a couple of years to bounce back. And it took Dan Mullen to help him bounce back. And I think when you saw Doug Peterson come in at Jacksonville, that was the biggest positive for Trevor. And I think you mm -hmm. see that now with Dave Canales and Bryce. He needed a coach to come in and and tell him he wasn't looking – he didn't need to look over his shoulder, that he could still do it. And the biggest thing that both Doug Peterson did with Trevor Lawrence and I think you're seeing Canales do with Bryce is stop forcing him into an offense and build yeah. an offense around him. And that's that's the difference between coaches that don't have a job and coaches that do. Mm -hmm. And it'll make a difference for Bryce as well. Sorry, I got off track there. No, no, that's great. That was going to be one of the biggest questions I had once I found out <laughs> that you had covered Trevor and you got to see that firsthand, like everything that yeah. happened. And then that was going to be my question to like the comparison for mm -hmm. Bryce Young. <laughs> it's funny, like going back last year before Frank kind of, you know, things unfolded the way that they did. I kept saying it, it, it was, it wasn't the same. I was like, they're different situations comparing urban to Frank. And then just as we learned more and more, I kind of was like, okay, maybe this is a lot closer than I thought. And to your point, I think that the year two with Trevor and getting that stability mm -hmm. and the foundation around him, which I, I'm excited to see what Dave yeah. Canales can do heading into this year. It's I think it's different situations, but it's the same results. Yeah. But with Urban and Frank, um, what happened to the quarterback? What happened to the rest of the team? That can mm -hmm. be – even if it happened differently, you know, I, Frank Wright wasn't out there getting caught on a bar stool or anything like that. But when you wow, – yeah. the, the results are the same. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that makes a – I don't know if people realize – unless you see it up close, how much that affects a quarterback, especially in their rookie season, especially, mm -hmm. especially when they're used to winning the biggest thing. And this was, I think this was urban Meyer's biggest problem as well. I'm just, you know, armchair psychologist here. Now mm -hmm. the biggest jump from college to the NFL. And I feel like I saw this a lot, especially those couple of years where I was covering both is um, when you get to the NFL, you have to learn how to lose. Mm. And, you because in college you can't if you're yeah. if you lose your season's over and it's a mm -hmm. little bit different now with the playoff is especially going to be different in coming years with the 12 team playoffs but for the most part guys like Tua Tonga Vailoa, Trevor Lawrence, Jalen Hurts, Bryce Young they had all they knew from college was was winning Urban Meyer all mm -hmm. he knew from college was winning and when you get to the NFL if you don't know how to come back from a loss and kind of let it roll off your back. I mean, my gosh, going backwards, Steve Spurrier, Nick Saban, like that, yeah. that was a lot of their problems. They let a loss spiral. Mm -hmm. And um, once you learn how to lose in the NFL, that can kind of in a weird way, set you up for success more than anything else. And I, I think that's a big difference you saw in Trevor's mindset year two. I think that might be a difference you see, in Bryce's mindset year two, because, you know, if you start and looking at this schedule, it's totally feasible. Let's say mm -hmm. you start four and two and then you lose your next three. Well, you know what? We're, last year we were doing 15. So sitting yep. here at four and five, oh, I can totally come back from this, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's once you have those battle scars from that, from a rookie season, like Trevor did, like Bryce did, um, it, it's a lot easier to kind of keep your head above water and not feel like you're drowning in the following years. That's a really good point. I was also going to, you kind of covered it too, just general differences and cut, like as you covered both at the same mm -hmm. time between like the NFL game and the college game. And you kind of talked a little bit about it there. Were there any other differences? Like I feel like NFL seems to be very by the book and open about injury mm -hmm. for the most part college I don't know. I guess it's changing a little bit with gambling and all, but right. it seems like two different worlds about what you know and what you don't know, or I don't know. If it's there are so any funny other you asked that. So funny you asked that because I had dinner last night. Um, ACC media days is currently going on in Charlotte. Yeah. And one of my really good friends who covered Gainesville at the same time that I did or covered Gators the same time as I did in Gainesville, mm -hmm. she now covers Virginia. And so we went to dinner last night and, you know, she was just asking how the job was going 
And I was saying, you know, Jackie, I don't know if people realize how different the worlds are jumping from mm-hmm. college to the NFL. And that's not to say one is easier than the other. Recovering yeah. recruiting in college is a grind unlike anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and and knowing how to cover a program who has lost a game and now their season is kind of over, it you know, that takes a, a special finesse as well. But covering the NFL is so regimented in a way it, it almost makes it easier and mm. but you do have a lot more information coming in so you have to figure out how to juggle it yeah. uh, open open locker rooms in the nfl colleges don't do open locker rooms mm. and a lot of times what you know about the players is what pr wants you to know or what pr has allowed you to know whereas in the nfl you can really kind of get to know these guys on a much deeper level it also yeah. makes it a little bit more about the player than the team. You know, in college, I mean, let me look at Notre Dame. They don't even put names on their jerseys. Yep. And so it's it's just a different dynamic. As a football fan, I'm always going to love college, probably college football the most. Mm-hmm. That may change with how the game is continuing to change. Yeah. But as a as a reporter, I love being in the NFL. I love the structure to it. And I love the fact, especially now working in-house with the Panthers, getting to kind of have access to these players that you never would on the college level and really kind of get to show who they are off the field. Yes. But even on the field, you know, what drives Mm -hmm. them on the field? um, How are they on the field? And so that's been really exciting. Um, But because you have so much access to them, you do also kind of have to learn to speak their language a little more. Um, Yeah. Like you said, I was in green Bay for a couple of years when I first got there uh, Aaron Rodgers was still there. I covered Aaron Rodgers for a year before he went to New York. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you got to have a dictionary to oh, cover sure. that guy. <laughs> and uh, that was probably the best on the job training I've ever had I'm was sure. um, covering Aaron Rodgers and standing there. And because when he would talk at his locker, he held court and not in even such a way as like, you know, some people just demand respect. He, Mm -hmm. he was, that was his pulpit and he knew it. And, uh, and, and that's not a a knock on him. It was fascinating. I'm so glad I got Mm -hmm. to cover him, but you did have to kind of stand there and filter what he was saying through what he, what was the truth. Mm -hmm. And, um, because he told you what he wanted you to know or what he wanted you to think. And so it was, it was a really, really good I'm so glad I got to do it. Um, And I'm so glad I was there while he was still there because it was, uh, actually, I think I might've covered him for longer than I was thinking. I covered him for a year and a half. Yeah. Uh, He, he trained me better than probably any other journalist or or, I'm sorry. He trained me better than anything else probably ever has as a journalist. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, that's in the NFL, a coach, I mean, a quarterback probably has, more weight to his voice than a coach does and that's not the case in college and so it's kind of just weighing that and weighing um you know what they're saying versus what they mean and and especially with someone like Aaron so that was a really long-winded answer to your question no that's really good insight and I think one of the things that you you still do and I heard you talk about in the other podcast is being that connection for fans Mm. to really get to know the players. And I think that's one of the, like you said, it's like who they are on the field, who they are off the Mm -hmm. field, but being able to kind of shed light on that and the work that you do, which I think is awesome. Yeah. That's my main goal, no matter what role I'm in or if the story is being told through a written piece, a video, a podcast, a tweet, some stories Mm -hmm. only need 280 characters. Um, No matter what the story is, can I be a conduit between this person and the fan who, who loves them and it, or it could be the game. Can I be a conduit between the game? If I have a, you know, a a peek behind the curtain, what am I doing to make that purposeful for the fan that is reading, listening, watching the story? Mm -hmm. Um, It's, I always tell people like when they are in school and they ask for advice, I say, if the day it becomes more about your byline than the headline, you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. and uh it's 
the story should never be about you. Now, some people are columnists and, and we need columnists to kind of yeah. have their voice, but that's, that's a little bit of a different field. And yes. um, so, and, and especially now with the Panthers kind of being able to be in house. Uh, I wrote a story on Bryce today and the, the intro to it was just something that I noticed walking through the hallway when he was leaving breakfast. Mm -hmm. And it was a moment between Bryce and, um, Smith Marset and a couple of the offensive linemen and that's that's access that I know not every media member has and so I don't want to take advantage of it or ever take it for granted like I've been given the trust by the Panthers and and the trust from the players to take care mm -hmm. of their story and so I don't ever want to make light of that or or yeah not serve them or the fans as well I was going to ask how different it is, which you kind of just said there. I was, I was genuinely curious too. It like, is different. <laughs> yeah. Being inside it, it, working. Yeah, versus... and it's something I've always wanted to do is work in house. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was so excited when the Panthers approached me, I was like, this is such a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I, even though it's something I've always wanted to do, I, I remember telling them in the interview process, like, yeah, I know it's going to be different, but I'll just, you know, it's, it's, there's going to be a learning curve and I'm expecting that, but I'll, I'll figure it out. There was a learning curve and it was a lot different than I thought it was going to be. Um, just in terms of, again, you're trusted with so much because you're there mm -hmm. with them. You're on the ground floor. You know, there's days I'm sitting there and, and Dave Canales might come up and sit down with me and have lunch. Like there's trust cool. there that I <laughs> need that I'm taking care of the information and you yep. want to you want to honor that trust while again, going back to honoring the fans that are reading it, you, you, you can't, you have to still tell the, the news. You can't mm -hmm. hide the news. I think the first gamer I wrote here for the Panthers was the game that Bryce took, or no, it was with the Jags. So it was the second game um, when he took six sacks. Yeah. I mean, that was the story of the game. Like you can't hide from the ugly truth of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's, and it's more so, there's just a, a greater trust there with information that is given and it's how you handle it. Um, yep. Whereas in the past, if I learned something, it's okay, well, I, I've got to write this and break it right away. Yeah. You got to get now it out. Right. Now it's not about breaking it as much. It's more about um, making sure that, that all the information is together before it's mm -hmm. put out. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, more different than I thought it would be not a bad different in any way, but something mm -hmm. that I admittedly did take me a little bit longer to get used to than I thought it would. I'm sure you just have those journalism instincts that are pounded into you and you're still a journalist. Don't, don't yep. get me wrong about that. Um, it's just a different tactic than you uh, use when you work for a newspaper. I agree. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. It's funny. I'm nowhere near being a journalist. I, I do an audio you do a pretty good job. <laughs> video podcast and talk about Panthers, but that's journalism, man. We're getting there. It's funny though. In, in my journey, I've almost, again, I clearly don't work for the Panthers, but I will say when I start, I've never said anything crazy. Number one, I don't curse. And like, I know I'm not going to yeah. talk bad about players but my vision and, and thought has shifted quite a bit as it's grown because there are people like maybe an undrafted free agent that follows me or this other college player. And it just changes my mindset to oh, these are humans. These are people. And I want right. people to feel respected and like maybe one day I'll eventually get some of those folks on the show. But I want to, mm -hmm. you know, bring that type of attitude because there's definitely another lane that you can go Ooh. with blasting out. And and I think as long as you're doing your job, the players know that. I mean, they know yeah. this is a business. Um, there was a guy in Green Bay. He was actually, I think, in Carolina, too, before he was in Green Bay for a while. Rasul Douglas. And he was so good about like there were times that like I, I didn't necessarily go easy on him. Mm -hmm. um, I also think he's probably the smartest player I've ever covered. Like he's, he's so intelligent, but that's, a, that's an aside. Mm -hmm. um, but there were times that like he had a play 
versus the Lions early last season that gave up a touchdown that swung the game. And, and so if you, I mean, it's a lot of big picture. Everybody has to do their part, but it would not have been out of pocket to say if Rasul Douglas makes that play, they might win the game. Mm-hmm. And um, after, you know, after kind of writing that story and talking about it on the podcast, Rasul then kind of sat down with me and he, he wasn't necessarily even defending himself. He knew he, he knew what he did wrong, mm-hmm. but just off the record, we kind of sat down in the locker room one day. Cause the Packers had open locker room like five days a week. Um, wow. And we sat down in the locker room and he kind of was like, here's what happened. Here's where I went wrong. Here's how I have to fix it next time. Here's how it relates to something that happened when we played the Lions last year. Um, mm. He respected the job I had to do and wanted yeah. to give me more context, not to not berate him, but to just mm-hmm. kind of in a way like he knew he'd messed up. So here, let me help you even do your job and kind wow. of give you a little bit more context. And and that's been my experience with most players. You know, as long mm-hmm. as you're not cruel, they understand yep. that you all have a job to do mm-hmm. and um, they'll respect you more for it because if you don't, they end up seeing you as like a fan and not, they don't take you as seriously. Um, it makes a lot of sense. And so it's, it's a very delicate balance. Um, but I've found as long as you're justified in your critique and you're not mean that usually you're able to strike it. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> that's really good insight. And you touched on something else too. that It's in my world more more real than I, you know i guess what you're going through now at this point like working inside the team but you talked about like the breaking news stuff mm-hmm. and i see darren you know darren usually kind of stays on top yeah it's a it is a it is a the wild west and originally when i started i was like i'm gonna i'm gonna do that and i'm gonna stay in the loop i had to get out of it i was like you know what if if it's something like sure if i'm in the moment and i'm on here and i see it I'll, I'll put it out there, but right. I can't do it. And I, I don't know how people, <laughs> how some people do I don't it. Either. <laughs> there are some people that are on every aspect of it and that's just yes. not me. And I think the day that I finally realized that that's not me, it helped me do my job so much better. And yeah. once I stopped trying to be what some of the other reporters around me were and realized like, we're all a little different and the yeah. beat needs all of us because we all bring something different to the table. It was so much easier to kind of just do my job without trying, because I wasn't forcing myself to do something I wasn't good at. Yeah. And so it's that wild. made a big difference. The there's like, I'm sure you see like the aggregator accounts, the mm-hmm. accounts that like, you know, there's a clip that pops up in practice and two seconds later, they've already like posted and clip. I'm like, I don't know how y'all do yeah. it, but I was just like, I don't, I don't know think how I they are either. <laughs> that wow. is a lot of time on the phone and computer and more power to them because I couldn't yes. do it. But yeah, it's it's a grind. So, so you covered Aaron Rodgers, you covered Jordan mm-hmm. Love, yes. Trevor Lawrence. Yes. And we talked a little bit about Bryce Young. Mm-hmm. And you know, you just put out the article, like you said, coming into this season general thoughts and like your expectations for him this year it seems to be much more stable both like front office wise Mm -hmm. coaching staff even position groups around him you know securing the the offensive line getting in new weapons how do you think like this year possibly can can look for him coming into year two i'm gonna cop out a little and say i want to see him in training camp first yep Makes sense. Because that's really, in my opinion, where I saw something from Trevor, his rookie season. Granted, Trevor's rookie season, um, oh, wait, no, he was drafted in 2021. So he had OTAs and everything. I I got confused for a second. Um, But, you know, OTAs, mini camp, there's only so much they can do. There are some days where you can't even really technically have a ball involved. And there's no hitting. Um, Everything is half speed. But when Trevor got to his first training camp, I was just like, man, like the the ball comes out of this dude's hand different. Like he's just, Mm -hmm. he's different back there. He's so steady. Um, And then 
with with Aaron, I mean, that's just no. I say the ball came out of Trevor's hand different. Nobody throws the ball like Aaron Rodgers, yeah, and true. he would do stuff in practice that I would be like, people shouldn't physically be able to do that. Like the physics mm-hmm. don't make sense. But sometimes he and Devonta Adams would just get out there and um, just mess around. And I'm like, how are they making this look so easy? But yeah. so, so you could see like Aaron was was polished by the time I got there. So you could already yep. see it in him. <laughs> but something to remember, just again, in reference to Bryce, um, Aaron had to go through what they called quarterback school when he got to the Packers. It was something that mm. uh, Tom Clemens, who they brought back to coach Jordan Love, um, was was put him through for because he sat behind far for a couple of years, but then they mm-hmm. completely changed Aaron Rodgers throwing motion. And, uh, you know, he already had the the moxie, um, but it was once they changed his throwing motion, that's when things really started to take off for him. And then, uh, like I said, they brought in Tom Clemens again to kind of help Jordan Love make that transition to starter and but yet again, you know, OTA's mini camp, it's like, OK, this is I'm not really seeing much. But then when we got into training camp last season, it started to just really kind of pop off. And you realize, like, Jordan might have it, you know, whatever mm-hmm. he needs to have. He's got it because I saw him in training camp the year before Um and that training camp from 2022 to 2023, that was a different quarterback. Like it was it was noticeable. And, you know, Jordan's greatest asset is that he doesn't get uh, flustered at all. And mm-hmm. he and he has a, a really big, like, effort mentality kind of when he's out there. Um, and so, but he still had a lot of mechanics that needed fixing. And they knew that when they drafted him. And But you saw that jump from 2022 to 2023 training camp where it all kind of put, it got put together. And so I really want to see Bryce in training camp because they have spent this off season installing a playbook better suited to his skills, Mm -hmm. um, which is getting him out of the pocket a little bit more and, uh, or moving the pocket around and not making him, he's not Tom Brady. And if he, if he can move a little bit more and again, this is, I mean, we're, let's just call a spade a spade. He's a lot shorter. And so you need to be able to move him around a little bit more just to get different throwing lanes. Mm-hmm. That was something, and I think you can read this story on Panthers.com. Um, we're doing this whole project about, you know, Dave Canales' uh, effort to get his throwing time down to 2.7. 2.7, seconds. right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and so I spent a lot, I spent a lot of time a few weeks ago with Nate Carroll, the passing game coordinator, and we and this was stuff that didn't even make it into the story just because Nate was like, you know, this is a little bit of proprietary information, but he was just kind of giving me some context. So to give you a little bit of a background without giving away the farm, mm-hmm. they feel Bryce is best used moving and mm. felt like he was he was at his best at Alabama when he wasn't being utilized as just a drop back quarterback. Yeah. And 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 he was very careful to not throw any shade on on the coaching staff last season, but you look at the film from last season, and that's kind of how he was used, yep. as as more of just a drop back. And so if if he can be moved around a little bit more, then he can have a a lot more freedom to see what's going on because he's really smart. And it should be noted, you know, like I said with with Rogers, they wanted to change his actual throwing motion with Bryce. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to change the throwing motion. He's got a good motion down. He's got a good arm. They want to change the throwing time. And and that's a little bit of a different animal. And that starts with the footwork. And so to, to kind of tie it back to where this point started, Mm -hmm. the transition with Jordan loves from training camp 2022 to 2023 was the footwork. That was so much mm-hmm. of what Tom Clemens worked on him with was was building it from the ground up, essentially, because and that was something that Aaron Rodgers used to say all the time. You throw where your feet are. Mm-hmm. And so to see the Panthers and to hear the Panthers talk so much this offseason, Dave Canales has said it. Bryce has said it. Nate Carroll has said it, that if you don't have the feet work right, 
nothing else matters and that that's been their biggest focus so far this offseason. I think they have spent a lot of time tweaking Bryce's mechanics because Canales is, is very, very careful too to, to make sure he's saying Bryce doesn't need fixing. He just needs polishing. He needs to be able to be who mm-hmm. he is. Um, but they have spent time tweaking his footwork all off season, implementing a playbook that's different than he had last season. And so we're not going to see that come together until training camp. You're yeah. really not going to see it come together until they put the pads on and they start going full mm-hmm. speed. Um, but he's got a better line. He never at at any point in his rookie season, off season or regular season, did he have his full five man intended offensive line. It's true. And he will have that presumably this year. Um, and, you know, at least going into training camp, he has a, a healthy five offensive line and going into the regular season, like Lord willing and the Creek don't rise. He'll have that same line. And that makes, when you invest 150 million in your line, you are expecting results. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, I, I think what's been the most interesting thing to see with him this off season is that starting back in February at the combine, Dave Canales had a very specific plan. He said, I want to hit this point, then this point, then this point, then this point. Mm-hmm. And he's made his way through the off season hitting those points. It's not, it wasn't even big picture. I'm sure every coach has a plan, but they kind of give you a little coach speak, but it wasn't big picture. Like, Oh, we want to make him comfortable. We want to improve this. He was like, no, I'm going to start moving his left foot this away. I'm going to put yeah. it. Um, I want guards that are at least the, at least weigh this much in front of him or, or this tall in front of him. And, you know, I need to start moving in this. He had specific plans and they've hit that. So can we see it all come together in training camp? Darren and I kind of have different points of view on this. We talked mm-hmm. about it today on our podcast. I said, when do you, when can you tell what a team will be? And mm-hmm. he said four or five games into the season. And I yeah. said, I think you can tell what a team is going to be by the end of training camp. Yeah. And <laughs> that's and that's I think like to the just to finish up this point uh-huh. last season the Packers started off pretty bad last season mm-hmm. and people were freaking out and I just remember talking to fans and saying you got to calm down because I'm telling you this team has it they have everything they need but there were yeah. going to be some growing pains I said I'm not freaking out about this team until we're six games into the season and by the time they got to six games in the season, they had it figured out. Mm-hmm. And and so I or well, I'm trying to remember what their record was, but that you saw at least the signs. They had a Saints yep. game where they came back in the fourth quarter and scored like 17 points, like unanswered. Um they had the games that made you encouraged, even if they weren't winning them, and then look at what they did and, and going into the playoffs like they did. Yeah. And so um and I felt comfortable saying that because of what I had seen from Jordan Love, from the receivers, from the pass rushers in training camp. So mm-hmm. ask me this question about Bryce again at the end of training camp. Nice. I'm with you. So it's funny. I interviewed Mike K probably a month ago. And I think he was kind of in the same court as you. He was like, we, t- we were talking about last year. And he's like, oh, no. He's like, I knew like going into, you know, at the end of training camp, going into preseason, and it's funny because fans, we saw the preseason and we're like, Ugh, is this real? We try to make up a bunch of excuses like, no, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Yeah. And then things just were, were not there. But <laughs> I can't wait. I'm I'm excited. I know, you know, coming off of two wins, it's, it's sometimes hard to get excited or a lot of people are trying to like set the bar low or lower. But, you know, I do like what, you know, everything that's happened in the offseason, what Canales is doing. Mm-hmm. So can't wait to actually see them and yeah see what they can be Darren makes a very very good point he said if we can get to the preseason and they can score a few offensive touchdowns that is true are feel a lot better that is so true <laughs> I'm like yeah, just put up right. some points that is, that is right. it. don't struggle to do it I mean even last year it felt like when they did score like it was like every ounce of effort or inch or whatever had to go their way like it was just it felt so hard Mm -hmm. so i'm yeah i'm excited to see hopefully what they're going to look like uh speaking of 
the last thing on the offensive side, and then I'll quickly do defense and we can wrap mm-hmm. up. Um, how has Austin looked at center so far? I know we're not in camp, but I guess through the right. offseason program. Um, he's looked good. There were, I think, at the early part of the offseason, some of the snaps were high, which was to be expected because he was yep. he was transitioning. But by the time we got towards you know the end of mini camp, they were there was a some growing pains for him and Bryce, but they were that's to be expected. Yep. Um, and I think by the end of mini camp, you saw that they really kind of had it figured out. And again, I want to see it in training camp against Live Speed. Yeah, but I I don't think it was a bad move. Um, you know, Darren wrote a story on this, but you know his position coach coming out of college at the time said that's good. That guy's a center. Like that's what he needs to be. Mm-hmm. And I think the snapping can be learned. The mm-hmm. biggest thing that a center has to be able to do is that's your, not, I don't use the word play caller, but that's really kind of the best way to describe it. Like that's your guy on the line that is, is getting everybody in position. That's, that's putting them where they need to be. And that knows the defense and so you've got Austin now who is of those interior guys, the only one that's returning, um, mm-hmm. you know, Robert Hunt came in from, from Miami and uh, Damien Lewis came in from, Oh, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. I'm Lincoln. Where did he come Seattle. from? Seattle. Thank you. Yeah, you're good. And there's so, there were so many this offseason. season. I know. And Robert um, and Austin Corbett, knows this division he knows the other defenses and so purely from just a a logistical point of view I think he makes the most sense at center the snapping will come yep do you is it Brady Christensen kind of getting back up snaps or yes yeah from what I have seen and so you know you've got I mean that's a pretty quality backup center there and so the line yeah, go ahead. can't have that many more like it think about all it went through last season it can only get yeah. better <laughs> so true uh, and then undrafted free agent i don't even know if he's like coming up on anything or if you're seeing the andrew rain out of oklahoma is he getting a lot of reps or i know he's like i know the, the name but i will be yeah. honest i have not seen a ton of reps that's not to say he's makes, not getting them yeah um but you know that I probably just have missed some of them. Yeah. I feel like undrafted it's, it's a much steeper hill to climb kind of going through that. So he'll probably get more in training camp just because um, you have to go more like you, you split, you split ones and twos. And so like all the offense from the ones are going to be on one side of the field and you're going to need them on the other side. So it'll Mm -hmm. somebody to watch. I'll keep his name in mind now. Nice. (laughs) I always say people like outside Panthers world, everyone is so hyper-focused on the center, the center, focused <laughs> on a lot of things, but it <laughs> just keeps coming up. Right. It's cool to hear the the insight and how things have been going. So so defense, and we got to hear from Clowney today. Mm-hmm. You, I know you did there, and Dan Morgan. I want to talk about the defense. I know about the players that we lost and Burns mm-hmm. and Luvu you know, some of the, the trade away um, for Dante, some of the things that have happened there. Right. We're hearing that in fans from the outside have always been like, oh, cornerback and edge. We got to have mm-hmm. this, these positions, you know, buttoned up a little bit. Heard from Dan today and I saw Darren that, you know, there's some workouts happening, but I guess from your viewpoint coming into this year, like, do you feel concerned about either of those position groups? Or do you think Ejero is just going to be able to, take what he has and, you know, go from there and kind of pick up where he left off last year. I'm slightly concerned about pass rusher, not because of the personnel that's there, but the depth. Um, It's true. If everyone stays healthy, that unit Mm -hmm. is, is a game wrecker. Um, But it's, it's kind of dependent on it staying healthy, which Mm -hmm. is why, and this is not any insight. I promise I haven't heard this anywhere in the building. This is just somebody who's been around the game for a while. I I would keep an eye on who shows up as a free agent um, just because, you know, they are first on the waiver wire. Yeah. Uh, So I I just think they're, 
you're planning on an 11 year vet staying healthy and DJ Wanham getting healthy mm-hmm. before the season, which is that timeline's possible. Um, it is. But it's, it's a lot of, and, and Dan Morgan would tell you this as well, you know, so it's, it's kind of, it seems to me a lot of like, hope this works out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if it does, that unit's not a concern, mm-hmm. but that's the only one that I'm kind of like, a little more depth a little worried. might not yeah. hurt. I think the secondary is fine. Yeah. Brought in Dane Jackson, brought in Jordan Fuller. Mm-hmm. I know this isn't the secondary, but brought in Josie Jewell. Um, you know, especially with Fuller and Josie and then Ashawn Robinson up front. Those are three guys that not only know Ajero's defense, all mm-hmm. had their best years in his defense. Yep. And, I, you know, those that, that's starters right there. Um, exactly. Dane Jackson as well out on the edge. And so I think they have talked this offseason so much. Ajero, Dan Morgan, Dave Canales has talked this offseason so much about the focus of the defense needs to be on creating more turnovers and Mm -hmm. they brought in guys that can do that. And so I think you pair Jordan Fuller back there with Xavier Woods, you put Dane Jackson out there on the edge and you've opposite uh, JC. And so you've got, and then you've got Troy Hill that you can kind of put in a nickel. Mm -hmm. The secondary doesn't concern me at all. Maybe it should, but as of right now it doesn't. (laughs) And nice. I think that putting um, Josie Jewell next to to Shaq is uh, that's going to be a, a really really good linebacker unit as well. Um, and again, I, I don't want to say the pass rushers concern me. That's just the unit I'm keeping an eye on the most. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think from from the outside too. That's kind of like what we're we're all thinking. Because to your point, it's really the the health and staying healthy. The depth mm-hmm. behind them, yeah. I think the the waiver wire, like you said, probably a good good thing to watch. Right. So we'll close out. Uh, training camp is officially here tomorrow. I know I got mm-hmm. to see some of the tons of videos posted out there today. It looks great from the setup. Yeah, you know, being it does. Being in Charlotte now at the practice facility, got to see mm-hmm. the. One end, I guess, which is VIP, has really nice, you know, or friends and family and all that. Nice set of bleachers. The other side looks really nice. They've yeah, got lots the, of activations. It looks really good. And then the cooling chamber yeah. trailer. I don't know what. I don't know what to call that. I know you wrote something about that too. Yes. So they have a cooling trailer out there this year. First time they've had it. It's not new to the NFL. Some other teams have it. Uh, the teams I think he mentioned were. New Orleans, Tampa, um, and then he said, you know, some Division One teams like LSU, Florida State, South Carolina, basically all the Got places it. it's really, really hot. Yep. And it is this trailer. They said it will fit 30 people. I walked in and I said, oh, you mean 30 football players? Because this thing could fit 50 people. Oh, wow. And it is 20 degrees. That is 20 degrees Fahrenheit. It is cold. Mm-hmm. And because we came back and we were talking about it and our boss was like, after a few minutes, he was like, wait, you mean 20 degrees Celsius, right? Like he said, mm-hmm. it's like 60 degrees in there, right? And we we're like, no, that is, it is frigid. You could see Ice your cold. breath when you walked in. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think what was interesting is is that Andrew Altoff, the director of performance, and Kevin King, the head athletic trainer, before we went in, were saying this is something that will allow guys to get back to practice. Whereas in the past, if they had, you know, if the heat had gotten to them too bad, you had Mm -hmm. to pull them from practice to either go get fluids or to get in the cold tank. And even the cold tank, you technically could go back to practice, but by then you're wet. By the time you get changed and get back out there, it could be over. And whereas this cooling trailer, you can step in for two minutes is what they recommend is just two minutes. Mm -hmm. And then you go back out. You would think that being in there and then going, Oh, I'm sorry. You would think that being in there and then going back out into the heat would be like whiplash and would make you feel almost sick. But I went in there today and was in there for about two and a half minutes. And when you stepped back out, you felt like good. Like the heat didn't bother you. And so (laughs) they figured out the science of it, I guess, at what temperature it needs to be in and how long you need to be in there. And I, I, asked Kevin King, the athletic trainer, I was like, how much 
do we have to bribe somebody to let us in here? And he's like, for real, you need it. Just get in there. (laughs) Um, But I think that it's going to be really, really useful to guys and allow them to come back into practice, take care of themselves, which is really the most important thing. And then also, you know, they said, we're, they said, we're thinking that players will use this after practice. You know, guys like to stay Mm -hmm. out there. I think of Chuba Hubbard and Tommy Trimble who stay out after practice every day and are always the last ones in. And now, when it's, you know, 95 with 95% humidity, they can get into the trailer after practice for a few minutes and then feel a lot more rejuvenated to stay out afterwards like they like to do. So, yeah, it's cool. That is really cool. (laughs) Exactly. I will say, even though going from Spartanburg, like what, an hour above Mm -hmm. us or, you know, above Charlotte, yeah, the humidity, the heat, all that stuff still going to be there. So mm-hmm. that is a really nice addition for the players. And I agree, like maybe they can let you all in every now and then. I know, right? Because <laughs> the, the stands, fans are, I think fans are really going to like it when they get out there. The stands are completely covered, so you're in the shade the whole that's time. Nice. And that's on both sides. Um, and actually, is it storming at your house? It is storming bad here in Charlotte. Oh, no, not here. The general population stands have the sun behind them, so it won't even be in. Oh, eyes. that's nice. Yeah. So, and they've got uh, water stations out there so people can get water. And, you know, the practices are at 9 30. And so yep. it'll be before you get to the hottest part of the day. So it's going to be a it's lot true. of fun. And then don't forget this Saturday, I'll be back together Saturday. That'll actually be in the stadium. And then next week, heading down to Clemson. Yep. A lot of fun. It's, it's already here, wild. I know you're <laughs> about to be busy, like you said, for the next months, 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 going, in, going yeah. nonstop. My plan for tonight is to sit down and watch the Netflix show Receiver, because I haven't yet, and, nice. and not do anything else, so that when I, so that when my alarm goes off at 6 a.m. tomorrow, I, I feel somewhat <laughs> rested. Yeah. There you go. Oh, that's awesome. Well, this has been great. I appreciate you coming on the show. I will say, or I'll plug you again, panthers.com. Find all of Cassidy's content on X, Cassidy G Hill. Yes. But I'll also let you, if there's anything else that you want to plug in right now or content wise. Yeah, that's, that's the main places. Um, And then, like I said, really, really excited about what we're doing with this 2.7 project that actually has its own landing page on panthers.com. I think you can find it by typing in panthers.com. 2.7 com 2.7 or something like that it's also pinned on the top of my twitter page so go to cassidy awesome. Hill. that landing page is there um really excited about that and some other things that we have planned for the coming weeks um yeah it's gonna be a lot of fun football's back so let's it. get to it awesome well i appreciate you coming on the show thanks thanks so much for having me got it have a good one you do